You all may be seated, everybody. So I want to remind you, for those of you who are visiting, those of you who may be new to our church, um, as the offering plate's coming around, <clears throat> you can give online. A vast majority of our people have opted for that option now, and uh, you can set it up as a recurring payment or what have you, just like a lot of our bills uh, are being paid that way, and um, I know I enjoy it, and I like it, and, um, and just wanted you to know about that. You go to our website, and um, you can see that um, and, and find those links there. All right, well, I ended a three-part series last week on biblical sexuality, and my intention for today was to preach a one-time standalone message about JBC, the biblical model, I mean, um, and I'm going to explain that in just a moment, or what's the DNA of our church? Now, in a couple of months, I will have reached the 27-year mark as being your pastor. Thank you for sticking with me. I was 29 years old when I got here. And I look back, and I think we did a lot of things right, and I did some things wrong. And you were very patient with us, and we've had some folks that moved on, and God moved them to other places, and I'm so grateful that our relationship with just about all of those folks are in tremendous standing, and we love our past members of JBC, perhaps who are going other places and, and who have found other places to serve. Now, if any of them are watching, those of you who don't go anywhere else and you used to be part of this church, you know you can always come home. You can always come home. But after 27 years, and, and I want you to understand the spirit in which I say this. I don't say this arrogantly. I actually say it with humility in my heart, knowing that it's taken me a long time. But I would think after 27 years, as a pastor, I should have a bead on what makes us who we are. Uh, it should be glaring to us what we do well. It should be obvious to us, you know, what, what our distinctives are. Um, because each church body has its own distinctiveness, correct? Wouldn't we say that? Each local church. It's not that one's better than the other, it's just that they're different, right? It's just like a husband and wife, um, you know, male and female, God created us, not wrong, just different, right? When Miss Penny, her and I got married and she uh, started hanging my clothes, see, she's left-handed, and my mother was right-handed, and Penny would, would, would put them on a hanger, what I call the left-handed way, and one day I made the mistake of telling her, you're putting the shirt's on the hanger, wrong. She goes, what do you mean wrong? I said, my mama doesn't do it that way. You talk about stupid. <laughs> hey, I've got stupid tax in my life, okay? I've learned the hard way on some things. And I learned pretty early on that it wasn't wrong, just different. And in the same way, in churches, it's not that some churches have it you know, better than the others. Yeah, there are, some, there, there are some churches that are on the brink of death, and unfortunately, they're, they're in a bad situation. But, you know, I'll tell you one thing that's happening all across America. You probably don't know this because, you, you, you know, I live this every day. But there is a national spirit of revitalization taking place among churches that are dying or dead, and they're open, opening themselves up to starting fresh and anew in the modern world that we live in. And, and some tremendous success stories are coming out of those churches. So with, with all of that, I started thinking, and I do this about every two to three years. I do it on a, on, a, on a slight version once a year. But when I get to the hunting season, I get a lot of quiet time by myself. And it's intentional. And it's on purpose. And I've found how helpful it is in my life. And I spend most of my time, when I hunt, I spend most of my time getting God to clear my mind. I, I call it a mental detoxing that takes place in me. And this year in particular, and, and every two to three years, 
I began, I began to evaluate my personal life in great detail. I began to evaluate my pastoral life. And I'm being very transparent when I tell you this. I asked myself some very hard questions, such as, I'm going on my 27th year. It's going to be 27 years if I get to April of 2022. And am I just riding a wave? Is my voice becoming dull to the the people in the church? Does God have a better leader for Jonesville Baptist Church? Now, the answer to that is he always does. There's always somebody a whole lot better than me. But here's the, here's the deal you have to think about. What does it mean to have a better leader or a better pastor or a better communicator? What does it mean to have a better church? And here's where, where, I, where, I, where I come down on, on all of this. You can always find somebody that can do things better than you. The question is, has God called them for that moment in time? That's the question. And so I ask myself the hard question. Am I growing as a pastor so that in my mid-50s, I can continue to lead this church with passion, with clarity, with, um, with intentionality, with, um, you know, with, with, with everything that JBC deserves. And I'm pretty hard on myself because sometimes I say, uh, boy, I don't know if I can do it. So then what I start doing is, <clears throat> let's evaluate what we are as a church. Who am I as a pastor? Why have we stayed together for 27 years? And why should we stay together another 27 years? (laughs) And one other thing before I jump into the message. I'm at the point in my life where I've thought about this the last five years. I probably never pastor another church as long as I live. That's where I'm at. That's what I hope. That's where my prayer is. I mean, if I stay this long, man, let's just go for it. Right? So I've got to think about it. I want to get in a little bit better health. What can I do to increase my energy? All of those things I think about. And in the process of doing all of that, God gave me some things. And I shared it with the staff last Saturday night and and their and their spouse. Kind of loosely put together. And in the last week I've been able to refine it. So what what was going to be one message has turned into three for sure, maybe four. You're not getting all of that today, okay, I promise you. So I just today I couldn't come up with a better title, so we put up the title page here. I just called it, Why JBC? Why us? What's different about us or what makes us who we are? I don't mean to say what makes us special, what makes us more special than anybody else. No, that's not, that's not what we're all about. And we're not here to promote us over anybody else. We're here to promote Jesus, right? So why us? And I came to this conclusion. I think over the years we've been very intentional about doing it biblically. Everything we do, we strain it through the strainer of biblical truth. And we've been able to just say, you know what? That's not really who we are. That's not biblical. We tried it. You find out it's not right, and you move on. We made some mistakes and things like that, but that's, that's part of growing, right? And you realize, okay, that, that's, not, that's not us. And then you move on from it. People ask me, why, why do we do such and such for only two years, and we don't do it anymore? Because it doesn't fit who we are, and it, it doesn't fit the model biblically. It's more 
about entertainment maybe than it is about worship and all of the things that we that we're going to talk about in the days to come okay so take your bibles go with me to first thessalonians chapter 1 verses 2 and 3 stand together with me first thessalonians chapter 1 verses 2 and 3 um <clears throat> In the greeting, Paul and Silas and Timothy, and he's writing to the church at Thessalonica. Difficult word to say for me. And in verse 2, it picks up, and this is what Paul is saying. He says, we always thank God for all of you. Listen, in my time of evaluation, I gain a deeper appreciation for you. It is my great honor in life to serve you. I don't want to serve another people. I want to serve you and any of the new people God brings in. That's where I want to be. You're my family. And so Paul says, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and our Father your work produced by faith, your labor promoted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the truth of your word. And thank you for the Thessalonian church. And how Paul was able to lay out the DNA there and the distinctiveness of that local fellowship. And he was very clear about what they did and, and who they were. And I see the similarities in who we are. And so I thank you for that. I pray that in this message, it's not self-promotion or self-promoting us as a, as a church. It's reaffirming what we are biblically. And that we're doing it according to Scripture. Thereby we're a New Testament fellowship. We are an ecclesia, a church. The church of the living God. At Jonesville. In this community. In this area. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Alright, so why JBC? JBC, a biblical model. Let me tell you why. Number one, I believe it has to do with our work. I believe it has to do with our work. If you look at the first thing here, our work. In verse 2, uh, in, I'm sorry, in verse 3, Paul says that he goes, we remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith. Your work produced by faith. So <clears throat> our church is not just here to entertain. It's not just here to uh, to just be here and to exist, there's a purpose behind everything that we do. And the first thing we see based on this passage is the Thessalonian church, they were known for their work, and that work was produced because of the faith that they had in Jesus. <clears throat> there's a lot of good work that can be done out there, right? But don't misunderstand what I'm getting ready to say. I'm grateful in America that we have a lot of uh, nonprofits that are not necessarily church-based or Christian-based, even though the, the principles might come from, from, from the church, you know. I mean, you have, you know, um, all these organizations. I'm not going to name them, but you can think of the local organizations that we have, and a lot of them do a lot of good things, and I'm not against that. That's good support a lot of it as much as I can. But the church is unique, okay? The church is not just trying to help someone in their physical need. The church is trying to transform somebody's life through their spiritual need. And you help do that by meeting some of the physical need. Jesus said, if you give a cup of cold water to someone in my name, I mean, give a, give a cup of cold water to somebody, you do it in my name. 
meeting needs so that you have the opportunity to share the love of Jesus with them? That's, that's what we do. But our work is different. Because our work is founded on the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's produced by our faith. Okay? Now I'm going to develop that as we go here. Number two. Number two. In our biblical model, it's not just our work, but our labor. The hard things we do, it's promoted by love, he says in verse 3. It's promoted by love. We labor with each other because of our love for one another. The Bible talks about That enduring love, the Bible says that we are to love one another and that love covers a multitude of sins. And the reason we can labor with each other and put up with each other is because of our deep love for one another. And the labor that we do, not just the work we do in ministry, but a lot of things that we do is prompted by love. Do you know as we speak right now, each and every Sunday... There is a group of dedicated people who are taking care of our children in the nursery. There is a group of dedicated people weekly that are taking care of our children in, in children's church. Uh, Janie Morrison. Janie, I want you to stand up. Just stand up. Just stand up. I know she's like, oh, no. Stand up. You see that lady right there? For years and years and years she was the leader of our children's church and she did it with no fanfare she did it with no applause she did it missing sunday after sunday after sunday after sunday after long sermons and long sermons and long sermons sir she was long suffering she labored and she did it out of absolute love That's what I'm talking about. That's the biblical model, and we have so many like that. I'll I'll mention you Wednesday night cooks. You know, you should never criticize anybody who cooks on Wednesday night. If you don't like it, don't eat it. But most of those people who cook on Wednesday night, well, not most of them, all of them, or not paid by the church. They're not employees here. They usually work the full day. They had to plan early in the week. They had to go grocery shopping. They had to go get everything. And then they had to come and take part of their day and cook and have it ready at 5.30 for you because you vultures were coming and you were hungry. And I'm one of them. And you come to church knowing that you can come and enjoy Bible study and work with children and come to youth group and on and on and on. And you do it knowing that, man, you're going you're gonna to get to eat and you won't even have to cook or do anything tonight. But somebody labored in that, right? Rachel, the other day, a couple of weeks ago, and she's done it a couple of times, she cooks this thing and it's got broccoli in it. What is it called? Cheesy chicken and broccoli bake. And I, all I heard was broccoli. Hate broccoli. <laughs> I like it raw. I just like, like, I don't like the stalk. I like the, and it's got to be cut in small chunks. But man, you cook that stuff? Well, let me tell you, I was hungry. And I was looking over it as I came through and I went, I'm going to just take the broccoli. Oh, my gosh, you can't take the broccoli out. It's all over the place in here. <laughs> and Rachel's like, Pastor, you, I'll take the broccoli out for you. I said, you will not do any such thing. Oh, I'm not. No, no, no. You know what this preacher did? He ate the broccoli. One of the best, uh, best Wednesday night studies I ever did. Don't cook me no more broccoli. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> People labor. It's our work. And it's, it's produced by faith, but it's prompted by our deep love for Jesus, for the ministry, for the people that we minister to, for you. Number three. <clears throat> 
in, in the biblical model we see here, he talks about our endurance. He says, your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So the model is to be a people of endurance. And who's the person we look to? Jesus. The Bible says, Jesus, look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who endured the cross. Endurance. We stay with it year after year after year. It becomes important to us day after day after day. We have the big picture, not just the micro, the small situation. Because listen, if you just respond in church life to the micro, you, you're going to get mad, you're going to get your feelings hurt, and you ain't never going to come back. I guarantee you, you say, well, that's never happened to me. Stick around. It's coming. You know why? Because you're a human being, you're flawed, we, we, we're all that way. I came home yesterday from uh, playing some golf with a couple of our, our men here from church, and I got home, and I was going around doing something, and Penny goes, you're tired, I know you're tired. I went, huh? I can tell in your voice. I was crank. She was, she literally, in a spiritual way, said, "You're cranky." So you know what she did? Her and my grandson and my son, they left. Oh, we're going to visit somebody. Good, I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> she was right. I was cranky for some reason, and you're gonna. It's gonna happen. And so when you have the small view of life, you're going to get your feelings hurt about something. But when you have the bigger view of church life, you can have an endurance mindset. You can have a patient heart with people. You can, it's just, it, and, and when you see it that way, and you see everybody as part of your family, you can endure. And it's inspired by Jesus. Okay? So, so this is the foundation for what I wanted to say today. Now, I want to get real specific about a few things, okay? And I'm going to just give them to you, all right? So in thinking about what are some of our distinctives, I wrote some things down. Here's one of the things I wrote down, our culture. This is our DNA, our culture. And here's our culture. I mean, I, I, you can say it all kinds of ways, but this is the way I like to say it. We believe that Jesus changes everything. He is our all in all. Look at what John 12, 32 says. Jesus says, if I am lifted up, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. So in all of our teaching, in all of our preaching, if we make Jesus preeminent, he will draw people to himself. And the culture that has been established here over many years by you and by me and all of us together following the Bible, Jesus is the one that we proclaim. This isn't Brother Corey's church. This is Jesus' church. This isn't your church. This is Jesus' church. He's preeminent. And then we see this in John 14, 6, Jesus said. This is why we preach the, the distinctiveness of Christ and the cross. John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So our culture is Jesus, and Jesus changes everything. Jesus can take a person that has racial hatred in their heart, and the moment he comes into their life, they're instantly changed. Even if they don't know it, their heart has changed. Jesus can take a filthy mouth man or woman who, who's just into the world and their vocabulary is trash and Jesus will come into their heart and all of a sudden their vocabulary gets cleaned up because when he comes to live within you, he clean, cleans the house in here. 
I know it because I got saved on February 12, 1984 that night. I didn't fully understand the concept of it. But the next day when I went to school and got with my buddies and we talked the way we talked, the first word that came out of my mouth was a cuss word and it cut me to the heart. And, every, and when I heard them saying it, I've never felt that way about those words ever before. And I knew something inside of me had drastically changed. It's as simple as that. And he changes everything. I was telling the, my Sunday school class today, I was a shy little boy, a shy teenager. You know, one of the few electives when I was in junior high, in my day, that's what we called it. We didn't call it middle school. Junior high. Seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. First time I discovered cheerleaders. Seventh grade. Oh, okay. Just being honest, tell you. If you read the Facebook post today, I said I'd be very transparent. And in junior high, we had classes and electives you could take. It was the first time ever. I was like, whoa, he, and we didn't have many. And all my friends were taking speech. Well, Corey, how come you're not taking speech? I will never, listen to me, never need that. I will never speak in front of people. I'm going to be a shrimper, and all I'm going to talk to is the shrimp and the guys on the radio and the people at the shrimp shed, and I'm going to get married, and I'm going to drink my beer, and I'm going to be happy, and I'm going to leave everybody else alone, and that's what I'm going to do in my life. Why do I need to take a class called speech? Woo-hoo, God had other ideas. Jesus called this shy not very bright, not noble, little sinful teenage boy, and he saved him and changed him from the inside out, and he called him to preach, and I went, what, what, uh huh? me? He changes everything. You think your marriage is a mess? It may, might be. You put Jesus first in your relationship. I guarantee you, I'll say it even like Justin Wilson, the old Cajun cook. I guarantee Jesus will change a marriage. He changes everything. When Jesus touches something, it's never the same. Second thing I want you to see about our DNA not just our culture, but our family focus that we have here. Our one big family mindset. As I read earlier in verse 2 in 1 Thessalonians, where Paul says, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. All of you. We're all part of God's family. And every one of you are important. And every one of you are special to this family not all of you are called to be teachers not all of you are called to work with children not all of you are to be everything that you think you can be but let me tell you you are gifted by God to do something and you're part of the body and you're very important and it's this family focused mindset that we have we're one big family we're one big dysfunctional family who have, who have, we have been made functional by the blood of Jesus Christ. Galatians 6.10. Look at the focus here. Galatians 6.10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the what? Family of believers. A true family. I see in our DNA not only our culture, not only our family, but our service to others. I tried something different in, in, in doing this. Put that up there, our service to others. Put the third thing, number three. Yes, there you go. So I'm sorry for the way it changes. Uh, it might be hard to read. Uh, I'll correct that for next week. But it says here, I saw the orange and blue, and I said, ha, ah, that'll be cool. Anyway, um, it's like, well, I'm preparing a sermon and I see a squirrel and I just, I lose it. But anyway, our service to others. 
what we do for others matter. So we just read the scripture, let us do good to all people. We're here not to consume. We're here for a lot of reasons. We're here to worship. But we're here to also serve. Here's a question. Ask yourself this. I do this to myself. When I was going back to hunting. Am I being served too much or am I serving? Well, what am I doing to serve others? Ask yourself this question. Am I doing anything, anything in some way or another through the church that's serving others? Now, there are many ways to do that. One way is you could be a giver in some way. And though you may not be the person with your hands on that ministry, but you're helping to fund that ministry. That's a way of service. That's one way. But that shouldn't be the only way. Because I believe we've got to get our hands dirty sometimes. So, our service to others, what we do for others, matters. It makes a difference. And the ones that I mentioned earlier, and I can mention tons of, tons of others. Our worship team, boy, weren't, whew, wasn't that awesome today? I wish we could have just sang for two hours. And you say, well, why, why didn't we? Because I had this message I needed to get out. But, service. Service to others. And on and on and on. And then finally here in our DNA. Now listen, I want to say finally. This is one message. I got a lot of other things to say to go with this that we're going to deal with next week. But our actions. Our actions. A lot of churches, and some churches I've been a part of, believe the right things. Had a high view of Scripture. Preach Jesus, but they were very deficient in how they lived it, in their actions. And there's the fruit of the Spirit right here in Galatians uh, 5.22. Look at what the Bible says. And I, I sh- Guys, I forgot. It should be 22 through 24, but here, let me read it. Let me get, get to it. Galatians uh, 522, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, which is long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Our actions. Our actions matter. It's not good enough to have a head full of Scripture, but a heart and feet full of sin. Our actions have to match what we believe. And I'm so grateful for so many in our leadership that live that way. But it matters. Let me just, let me turn it internally, though. I think a lot of churches are fairly good when they focus on others with their actions toward others. I believe there most churches that when they do turn to others outside of their church, they treat them really well. And that's good. <laughs> Why wouldn't we? But it's when you turn on the inside sometimes that it gets messed up. Why is it in family life, that the people we love the most, we hurt the most. Why is it in family life that the people we love the most, we say, bless you, we say the most cutting things to? Well, I think one reason is that we know we're safe emotionally. That Don't go a third time? <laughs> Sorry, Mike. It's okay, buddy. When I sneeze, man, I throw my back out and everybody in the house wonders what in the world happened. So I get it. Um, Why is it in families that we do those things? I'll tell you, it's because we know we're loved 
We know that that person is going to forgive us. I think subconsciously we believe that. And I always say this, and I believe this. When we get really emotionally anger, angry, we get sinfully angry, I believe we temporarily are insane. I do. Temporarily, because we, we, our emotions overtake. It's like it floods our brains. It, it floods everything we know to be right, and we go in the opposite direction, and it just it comes out and we say or we act or we do to the very people we love the most. And I'm not saying it's right. It's actually wrong. And the reason I say we're temporarily insane because once the hot passion of that anger simmers down, we get back to our right mind, we feel unbelievable remorse, and we're like, and I'll, I'll tell you, I've said things that my family later said to me, Dad, what you said hurt me. And I went, I didn't say anything hurtful. And they tell me what I said, and I said, I did not say that. And they're like, oh, yes, you did. And Penny's looking at you, yep. So hot with emotion and anger and passion that I couldn't even remember what I said. So it's important that our actions match what we believe toward each other. It is important how we treat each other. It's not good enough to say, well, he's my brother in Christ and he'll just get over that by me saying that to him or She's my sister in Christ. It's not okay for us to just be cutting and hateful and mean when we're in a bad mood and just think that it's all right. And, and, and it's, it's, just, it's just not. It's not conducive with the fruit of the Spirit. And so our actions toward each other matter. And I believe this. I believe in our DNA here at Jonesville, over the years, we've grown together. And I'm going to speak about the concept of growing next week and what all it involves and what all it means to us and what it means for us staying together in the future and all of that. We're going to deal with that next week. But I believe that here at this church we have a lot of folks that have taken this last point very seriously. It's not a put on when they come to church and treat each other with love. It's not a put on when maybe somebody said something to them that was cutting and they didn't react, they didn't respond, they didn't attack, they just covered it with the love of Jesus and moved on. Because they're serious about living with the fruit of the Spirit. It's not an act. It's a serious deal to them. And I'm telling you, when that happens and when that continues in a church, let me tell you what happens. There is a thirst on the outside. People who are not part of us, when they see that and experience that and believe that it's authentic, there's a thirst to want that. People want it. I want to be part of a family like that. I want to be part of a church that doesn't scream and yell and fight at each other and, and mistreat each other. I want to be part of a church that displays the fruit of the Spirit toward each other. As a matter of fact, I want to learn how to be that way. I want that in my life. Man, that is an attractant like you can't believe. And I'll tell you how I know that, because I experienced it in my life before I was ever a pastor. It's one of the things that opened my heart up to the gospel was seeing my home church. I never saw people talk to each other so nicely before. And I went home after a couple of weeks of attending that church and seeing, my gosh, they, act, they were hugging each other before church. They were happy to see each other. And I'm thinking, this can't be. They, obviously, they go home and mistreat each other. They, go, they yell at each other all the time. This can't be real. And so I talked to my dad, and I was telling my dad about that. And it, it, I don't think he's watching, but I'll mention this man's name. And I said, Dad, I saw this big giant of a man named David Carey. And David Carey was just hugging all kinds of people 
and just being so kind, and he's a leader in that church, and he's a, I think he taught children at the time. Maybe he didn't, maybe, but I don't remember him. Maybe he taught a men's class. I don't remember exactly that, but I just remember, just, it just stuck out in me like this big giant of a man. Just so tender and so kind. And my dad said, Corey, it's not a put on. I know Dave Carey. He's one of my clients. But his company, we insure his company. And he's that way all the time. Really? Now I'm I'm 17 years old, man, and this kind of stuff is making an impact on me. And it opened my heart up. And to be honest with you, it put a hunger and a thirst in me, and I'm like, Huh? Where can I get some of this? That's that's kind of well, so that's when I started talking to Penny and 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 her cousin Pete who lived next door to me and and I started asking them about their belief system and when they told me the truth about Jesus and made me mad because it it, it 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 convicted me and it offended me and I kicked them out of the house and two days later I'm like, can y'all come back and talk to me? This stuff won't leave me alone. <laughs> And they did. And I became a Christian. And everything changed. And there's a new way to live. I remember years ago, my brother, who's also in the ministry, who's a pastor in Texas, um, we were all home for, for the holidays back in Louisiana. And we were still, we're young, in our 20s, young, young pastors and We got into a theological discussion at the Thanksgiving table, and you could tell, you could feel the uncomfortability going on in the family. Because they knew us, and they knew it was going to turn ugly. And we could feel it, but we couldn't stop it. And my brother said something, and it invoked a reaction in me. That was cutting, mean-spirited, and hateful. It had moved off of the topic, and it went to motive, and it went to hurting. And boy, when I said it, he was, and before he could say anything, he said, time out, time out, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He said, time out, time out, everybody, time out, stop. So give me a second. I bowed my head and I asked God to forgive me. And tears began to flow down my face and I said, I'm sorry. It's never right to be hateful. It's never right to attack you personally. And what I just did was wrong. I can't promise that I'll never do it again, but I hope I never do. And I'm going to try never to do it. I might have done it. I can't remember ever doing it again. And here's why. It's not that I'm some great Christian. It's that I'm a Christian. Jesus changed everything. Immediate conviction. And my actions were wrong. And you know what? To their credit and my brother's credit, he took a deep breath and he said, it's all right. No problem. Let's talk about something we all agree about uh, agree on. The saints stink. You're not part of my family now. And, and Yeah, you are. That's right. You're a brother in Christ. <laughs> I'm messing with you. Yes, sir. So y'all, I hope this is making sense to you. I wanted to do a deep dive on the distinctives and the DNA, if you will, of who we are. And to be honest, to check us against the truth of Scripture. And I came up with this title this week, Why JBC? Why are you here? Why are we part of this church? Why are you visiting? What do you like about this? What what brings us together? And I believe it's because whether we... We did it intentionally, or I think you can't help but 
do it when you're following Scripture. I believe that we have a biblical model that fits who we are, what our gifts, and, and, and so forth and so on. And I believe it's a pretty special place because of Jesus and because of you. And to wrap it up from what I started with, when I looked at it that way, when they don't need a new voice, because the voice they need to hear is the voice of the Holy Spirit. They don't need a younger pastor. And I don't need another group of people in another church. What we need to do is continue to do what God's called us to do and be faithful. And continue to model biblical Christianity within us, without, along with some of the things we're going to build on in the next few weeks. And we can stay together until God calls us home. That's what I believe. I know some of you are thinking, doggone it, I thought we'd get us a new pastor like a new coach. You want to know the truth? The last time I updated my resume was 1999. I don't even know if the current computer systems we have today would even be able to call that up. It's saved in some file. I, I, wouldn't, I don't even know what it's saved. Maybe it's saved under a file that says resume. I have no idea. We got to grow where we are. Let's do this thing together, church. Let's do it together. My commitment to you as a pastor is we're going to keep growing this biblical model. And we're going to keep growing together as Christians. And we're going to keep reaching and obeying and following the Lord Jesus and doing what we do. And some things will never change about what we do. And some things will change as methods change i mean we do live stream we didn't do live stream 30 years ago there's no need for that right but we do it and it's important and it reaches a lot of people so yeah we'll change models not models we'll change methods as we go along but our model stays the same it's biblical in nature i told this to our sunday school class today the one of the things that I deeply appreciate about this church is the absolute respect and love you have for the teaching and preaching of God's Word. Man, you offer so much respect to it. And though after an hour and ten minutes you're ready to go home and you want me to shut up, you will not let me know that out of respect for the Word of God. Until after church. <laughs> so thank you, church. I really don't know what to tell you as far as the invitation. Maybe what we need to do is hit this altar together and just pray that God would keep using this church. This church is, I don't know, almost 160 years old. Been here a long, long time in this community. And it doesn't take long for a church to die. And God has got us where he's got us for a reason. People are like, don't you want to sell the property and get on 26? No. I'll deal with, deal with the bulls that keep coming in our yard and tearing things up all the time. I like it here. Don't you think you should change the name? Nope. 
I thought about it years ago. Maybe we should change the name. But people know. We are JBC. Good, bad, and ugly. That's who we are. <laughs> so, let's pray that God would continue to pour His Spirit out and grow us and develop us to be who we need to be. Let's stand together.